this epic of Exodus has really begun in earnest as Moses has taken these steps back to Egypt. He's obediently returned. He's doing what the Lord has told him. He's faithfully fulfilling Yahweh's commands. Go. And we left off at the end of chapter 4 that Israel is responding rightly. It's a great miracle. They have bowed down and they're worshiping the Lord just as God said they would. And they're bowing their lives in faith to the Lord, the Lord who has remembered His covenant, who has heard their cries and has promised that He is coming to rescue them and deliver them into His presence. They've started to trust that Yahweh is who He says He is, and He will do what He says He will do. Yet before things get better, they're going to get far worse. Their daily lives are going to be ground down into even harsher slavery and work They have gone, in a sense, from the frying pan into the fire. And the question here is, how is God's firstborn son going to respond? Will they cry out to their loving father or their cruel master? Will they turn to the Almighty or to their enslaver? We see the answer. And the question comes to, how will God's great deliverer Moses respond We have a man that is beginning to grow in faith. He's not perfect. He's starting to trust the Lord and move out in boldness and confidence and faith, and he has great failings wondering, is this really going to work? What's happening here is this exodus begins in earnest is this is a showdown. And you have to remember this. It's not Moses versus Pharaoh. It's not the prince of Egypt here versus the king of Egypt It's God versus a fake God. It's Yahweh saying, thus says the Lord, and Pharaoh saying, no, 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 thus says Pharaoh. It's the real God versus the pretend God. And the battleground of this showdown is right in the lives of the children of Israel, the children of God. Therefore, the stakes of what's going on couldn't be higher This is even bigger than a struggle for emancipation, even a struggle for life. This is a question of sonship and family. To whom does Israel belong? To whom does their loyalty belong? To whom does their worship belong? To whom does their soul belong? Who's really in control of their well-being and their future Who will they turn to for relief and hope and identity and salvation? And if the central theme of the entire book of Exodus is sonship, the central question of Exodus is this, who is this Lord that calls people to be His firstborn sons? Who is the Lord? It comes out of Pharaoh's mouth here, but it's the question of Israel, it's the question of Egypt, it's the question of Moses, it's the question for you and for me, who alone is in control and worthy of our praise? Who is so mighty and wonderful that we should obey His voice? For Israel, the question is, is that Pharaoh or is it Yahweh? This is the practical question for Moses. And for Israel, it's a practical question for the king of Egypt and his country. Who's really in charge? Who has authority over our lives, over our nation, over all of creation? To whom should we bow? To whom should we listen? To whom should we give our ultimate service? And again, that's a question for you today too as a disciple of Jesus Christ, and as a discipler for Jesus Christ. The moment-by-moment question that we have is, who is the Lord that I should listen to His voice? Who is Jesus that I should listen to Him? Even we who belong to God as His children, we're asking that question to ourselves subconsciously, even if you don't realize it. 
when we're tempted to sin, when we're tempted to choose our own way, when we're tempted to follow our stomachs or our flesh or our culture or our spouse or our friends. The question is, who is the Lord that I should obey His voice and not my own? Who is God that I should listen to Him and not my heart, not my media, not my politicians? Who is God that I should listen to Him over my culture, over my media, over my addictions, over my friends, over my temptations to sin and rebellion? And dear ones, as we talk about making disciples, this is the question for us as evangelists. You know that's what you are, right? You are called to be evangelizers, gospelizers. What's the central question that you are sent out by Jesus Christ and His authority to ask people? Who is the Lord? Who is your Lord? And what's the question that they're really asking back? What's the question underneath all their other questions is, who is this Lord you're talking about? And why should I listen to Him? Above all the other pretend gods, above my own heart, above all I've been taught, above all I want to believe and listen to, why should I listen to your Lord? And why should I follow His ridiculous claims on my life? He wants me to lay down my throne and bow to His? He wants me to let go of pretending to be king and queen of my life and follow Him? It's ridiculous. It's silly. He wants me to change my lifestyle, my sexual orientation for Him? Who's this God that you're talking about, and why should I listen to Him? Dear ones, that that is the question of the gospel. And as you go forth to share the gospel, that's the question that we need to explain and answer and proclaim today. And hopefully you can better understand this question for yourself and bring it to the pharaohs around you this week. Let's look carefully at those 12 verses. We'll really just focus on the first five, and then let's explore what this crucial, explosive question means when it comes to the gospel and our lives. Let's look at verse 1. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. After Moses and Aaron have met with the elders, they somehow gained access to the palace, to the throne room of the most powerful man in the known world at that time. Maybe Moses still had some palace connections. But the Lord God who has sent him and told him to talk to Pharaoh has sovereignly opened the door for that thing to happen. The Bible just makes it so clear. It doesn't even need to tell us. Yes, God said go. He went. God said talk to him. The door is open. God told him, come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. That's, that's his mandate, his mission. You have to wonder, as Moses is taking this step of obedience, if he's very optimistic. I mean, on one hand, the Lord is with him, right? He's believed in this. And the Lord's words have been coming true. Aaron came out to meet him. The people are worshiping. They listened to him. The signs worked. There he is, standing in front of Pharaoh. I mean, maybe this is the boldest, most confident this man has ever felt. This is going to work. But on the other hand, on the flip side, he's, Moses is in a familiar place. He's, he grew up in this palace, remember. He knows what pharaohs are like. He knows that their word and their power is law, that they see themselves as divine beings. Even though Moses knows this pharaoh is just a man, that's not what everyone else thinks. And Moses is standing there maybe shaking a bit because he knows all the evil that this king can unleash at a word. But even besides all of that, all of his experience, in the burning bush encounter, Yahweh told 
Moses, very clearly, Pharaoh is not going to believe you. He is not going to set the people free, not at first. Do these signs knowing that he will not listen, and I am going to harden his heart against the will of God. Moses hasn't seemed very brave the last time that he was in Egypt. He ran away. And the last time he was in Egypt trying to set his people free, it ended in disaster. But you know, the good thing, brothers and sisters, is a lot of times we don't have to guess what people were feeling or doing if you just use your Bible. Because in Hebrews, that great chapter of faith, chapter 11, we keep referring to about Moses, God's own word tells us Moses went by faith. And it says, quote, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him, God, who is invisible. So the Bible tells us he was standing there not shaking, and not because he had boldness in himself or confidence in his delivery. Remember, he knows he's not really good at that but he has confidence in the Lord. Where did this courage come from? Hebrews tells us that he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Who's that? God. He trusted God's promise that Yahweh is with me just as he said he would be. And it's his authority, it's his power, it's his sovereign plan that is working through this simple staff and this simple man named Moses. We know that Moses is a changed man, not by magic, not by willpower, but because he encountered the living God. Look at verse 3 of chapter 5. That's what he says, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now, Pharaoh doesn't know who that is, but he's announcing in language that Pharaoh would have understood, this is a theophany. I have seen God. I have beheld God. Moses' boldness comes from the fact that he has encountered the only God there is, the living God. And Moses, beholding God, had even a tiny inkling of the glory and the majesty of God, the awesomeness of God, the love of God, the caring of God, the God who hears His people suffering and moves to do something about it. He understood that there is no one like the Lord. He asked his name and he told him, I am who I am. There is no God beside him or above him or even below him. He is the one and only. Moses beheld the Lord and he knew even a tiny bit of what the Lord is like. Remember, the Lord reveals Himself to us people with the purpose that we would trust who He is. He doesn't expect us to guess. He doesn't expect us to have blind faith. He expects us to hear His revelation and then by His grace put our trust in who He says He is, not who we think He is, not who we want Him to be, but who He is eternally. And when you know God, When you really know Him and you behold Him, the only response is to worship Him and trust Him. Pharaoh's biggest problem is he doesn't know God. Moses does. And Moses is there because God has graciously revealed Himself to him. Think of something very similar with Jesus' groupies that turn into men that literally turn the world upside down and go forth and change it by His power and authority. Before the cross and before Jesus really revealed Himself to them, they come across as cowards, not confident men. They run away. They hide. They're embarrassed of even saying they know who Jesus is. 
So then why are they all, just a few years later, getting killed for the gospel in the name of Jesus Christ? What changed? What made these men confident? Did they go to a seminar? Did they read the right book about how to be a better public speaker? No. They met the living God, and His name is Jesus Christ. They had an encounter with Him, and God graciously revealed Himself to them. Then they knew the life and the death and the resurrection of the one real God, and that's what they proclaimed. And that's the confidence they went with. Not, I know what I'm doing, but I know the one who changes the world. And they went forth boldly and in confidence. Dear ones, that really encourages me because I'm thinking about as a church, how are we going to stand before people, even tyrants, and share the gospel with them? And the question I wrote down is, have you met the living God? Have you? You don't need a mystical out-of-body experience. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, you meet God in His Word. You know who He is. He's personally revealed Himself to you. And by faith, you have put your trust in Him, and you know He's united His life with you. You know He's real, and you know His name, and you know His character. Have you met the living God? You meet Him right through His living Word, the Bible. And He does walk with you and talk with you. You meet Him in your prayers. You meet Him in your worship. And as you know this God, and as you then live out His commands, as you love your spouse and your family the way God says to, to the best that you can, as you don't compromise your convictions in your workplace, as you turn the other cheek, as you show mercy and kindness and grace to people, as you go forth and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, I bet you might have one or two people who used to know the old you and they say, what happened to you? Who are you? Just as Moses is standing in that palace, and I bet if there's anyone who knew the old Moses, they said, who are you? What happened to you? And it's not because his beard got longer and his clothes got dirtier. And I think Moses' answer is the answer that we need to have what Peter and Paul needed and had. Our answer to our friends and our neighbor has to be, because I encountered the living God. That's what's different about me now. Where'd you get this confidence from? Why don't you care so much about what people think about you? Why aren't you so connected to your job and money defining you? Because I met the living God. And He has fulfilled everything I need. And He made me His child. How do you know what's true? How do you know what God you're proclaiming? Because I encountered Him in His Word. And I know Him. And He has shown Himself to me and given me faith to believe. And that is how I proclaim Him to you. Is that your testimony today? Dear ones, that's our only hope for evangelism. So we know the real God because we have met Him ourselves. Well, look what He says in this boldness. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. That's a a bold initial appeal. Now, some scholars see here that Moses might be misrepresenting or mishandling God's Word when you compare it to Exodus 3.18, and I invite you to do that this week or even now, flip over there. But I think when you connect 5.1 and 5.3, you see that Moses is accurately and faithfully declaring God's words. He uses the word feast, but then he does say the word sacrifice, which is what God told him. Now, the one way that he might be disobeying God here, and I'm not just making a case for Moses, I can admit his flaws, God told him and Aaron in 3.18 to take the elders with you, but here we can't be sure, but it looks like they're not there. It's just Moses and Aaron, and God wanted the representatives of Israel altogether to be there, but they're not. 
But I want you to keep in mind what God is telling Moses to say here. The goal of the Exodus is the same goal of the Christian life. It's to glorify God. God sets us free to worship Him. Our lives are redeemed from slavery so that we might glorify the living God. Through faith in Christ, God's firstborn Son, God the Son Jesus, He makes us firstborn sons of God. Why? So that we can serve Him as our loving Father. So that we can dwell with Him in eternal peace with nothing hindering our relationship so that we can live in His direct presence, so that we can know Him and enjoy Him forever. Israel wasn't just set free. That's not what the Exodus is about. They were liberated for an ultimate purpose, a freedom to right worship. They were emancipated to be the people of God the people God desired and designed them to be, His children, to live with Him, to listen to Him, to give Him glory. Do you know today that's why Christ sets you free? He wants you to walk with Him and talk with Him as His own child, to listen to His voice, to be able to follow His call on your life, to know Him, to love Him, as He knows and loves you. This is what Yahweh, the God of Israel, says, Release my people so they may celebrate me in worship in the wilderness. That's the reason. He doesn't say to Pharaoh, Let my people go so they can have a better life. Let my people go so they can realize their potential. Let my people go so they can have their best life now. That's not what He says. It says, let my people go so they can live an ultimate life, life with God. Dwell with their Father. I know we're still on verse 1, but look with me for a moment at these beautiful words of what God is saying. He says, thus says the Lord. What that tells us is these are not Moses' words. Therefore, thankfully, they don't come with Moses' power. They're God's words. They come with God's power. They come with the assurance of God's promise. This is Yahweh speaking to Pharaoh, not Moses. They are Moses' people, but that's not what Moses is saying. He's saying, as just a vocal box declaring forth the oracles of God, he's saying, this is God speaking. I'm just a human instrument. And God says, those are my people. Set them free. Isn't that way more powerful than Moses saying that? He is a prophet of God, which means he cannot say more or less than God desires him to say. And that's what he's doing here. YouTube, unfortunately, is littered with fake prophets. We should probably spell it P-R-O-F-I-T-S. And they're full of all kinds of vagaries, like, I think the Lord is saying, or I declare the Lord is saying things that he's clearly not saying and that contradict his word. Be careful with that stuff. But Moses is not here giving his opinion. He's not speaking his mind. He's not talking in vagaries. He's telling the very things God told him to say, let my people go. Because these are God's people, God's firstborn son. And what God is doing here is confronting Pharaoh with the truth. These are my people, not yours. You think this is your property, these are my children, so let them go. And of course, Yahweh knows well and good that Pharaoh is not going to let his children go, not yet. This is going to be a violent and awesome rescue mission that God is going to invade Egypt, and by his mighty hand, he is going to snatch his children out of Pharaoh's hand, and he's going to deliver them to the promised land. Again, so they can dwell directly with their heavenly Father and celebrate Him in joy and peace and feasting. If anyone tells you again, following the Lord is boring, 
point them to these passages at the beginning and the end of the Bible that says knowing God is a party. He calls us to celebrate with Him. That's what we are going to do soon. Verse 2, the Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey His voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. Again, he's using the word Yahweh here. And moreover, I will not let Israel go. I don't know who you're talking about, and even if he's real, I'm not going to listen to him. Now, when Yahweh encountered Moses in the wilderness just a few chapters ago, Moses had a similar question, a way saying, what is your name? Who should I say that you are? And God reveals, I am the God who is. I am the great I am. And Moses and Pharaoh, living in a pluralistic society, a culture of many regional gods, and Egypt having a hierarchy of a pantheon of gods, it's an understandable question. What god are you talking about? I don't know this new name. I know Horus. I know Ra. I know Happy. I don't know Yahweh. And that understandable question then comes with understandable disobedience. I don't know who you're talking about. Why would I listen to him? Why would I listen to him? Now, dear ones, as Christians, I've I've thought how to say this to you succinctly this week. We live in a great country. We can organize and legislate godly principles without worrying if people totally understand them. We can stand up, for example and be salt and light in the world when it comes to human sexuality, human trafficking, pornography, drug use, abortion, same-sex marriage, trans rights. But dear ones, as we stand up for God's words and His doctrines and His clear values, don't be the least bit shocked when your friends and your co-workers, and our culture turns around and says, who's this Lord that I should obey His voice? We are Christians in the marketplace, in the public square, and we should proclaim the Lord doesn't want two men to be married, but we shouldn't be the least surprised when people say, who's your God, and why would I care what He says? Why should I give up my life for such a God? I don't know who He is. Do you understand that? We shouldn't be surprised. We tell people, God wants you to do this. God wants you to do that. And they say, who are you talking about? And why should I listen to him? Some will say that because they are ignorant of the one true God. Some will shout that because they're already obeying the voice of other gods, including their stomachs and their flesh and their own hearts. And again, Pharaoh's going to find all this utterly silly because, number one, he's asking him to do something absolutely ridiculous. Let go the entire workforce that you've manipulated to build your cities and empire on their backs. Let the economy of Egypt go and crash down as Israel leaves. Pharaoh would say, why would I do that? Are you nuts? Why would I listen to such a god? But more than that, Pharaoh again believes he is a superhuman who is divine. They believe that the Pharaohs came from the sun god Ra. They were direct descendants. That the monarchy of Egypt was as old as the world, as old as the gods. So when Moses says, thus says the Lord, thus says God, Pharaoh says, no, I didn't. That wasn't me. What are you talking about? And he counters it by saying, no, thus says Pharaoh. I'll tell you what's going to happen. And he doubles down on the slavery and the abuse. Guys, this is what we are always going to deal with when we share the gospel. When we say, thus says the Lord, people say, why should I listen to your God's voice over my own heart, over my own desires? over my own will? Why should I listen to your God's will be done when I'd much rather listen to my will be done? 
When you share these things to people in your family and your friends, and I know you get frustrated and disappointed like I do and say, why don't they believe? Dear ones, part of it is they're ignorant of the real God. They don't know Him. Another aspect is they don't want to. It's much more interesting to listen to thus says me than thus says the Lord. But again, that's the central question here. It's a central question for our life. Who is God? If there is a God, who is He? They can't all be legit, so how do I know which one is the Lord? And then why should I obey His voice? But in arrogance and disobedience, Pharaoh says, I do not know the Lord, and moreover, even more so, even if I knew Him, I will not let Israel go. Romans 1 tells us clearly that the world is in a sense ignorant of God, but God has revealed Himself clearly to everyone in our planet. But the problem is not an ignorance of a lack of information, it's a disobedience of our will that suppresses that knowledge of God and says, I will not believe. In John chapter 3, Jesus puts it this way, the light has come, but people have shrunk back into the darkness because they do not want to be exposed. They do not want to bow to Jesus Christ. So they pretend they don't know Him and ignore Him as a license for their disobedience. The Lord gives, in a way, kindly Pharaoh here an easy out. He gives him, in a sense, an easy initial request. I know you don't want to let them go forever. Let them go for three days almost as a way to compound that hardness that the Lord said. He said, you won't even do this. And it proves, even in the grace of God, Pharaoh will be hardened. Well, so much of the rest of the Exodus is the Lord giving Pharaoh a theology lesson, especially about who God is. He says, Pharaoh, you you don't know who I am? I'm going to show you. Because God knows who Pharaoh is. When Pharaoh says he doesn't know who the Lord is, so you're going to find this throughout the rest of the book. God's going to say things like in chapter 8, Be it as you say, so you may know there is no one like the Lord our God. Or in chapter 7, The Egyptians shall know that I am Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. Then you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. In chapter 9, he says, So that you may know there is none like me in all the earth, so that you may know that the earth belongs to the Lord. Or in chapter 11, verse 17, God says he wants Pharaoh to know that Yahweh makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. Why is God doing these plagues? Why is God working this way in Egypt? Out of all the ways he could deliver his people, he makes it clear to us, we don't need to guess, I am doing this so that Pharaoh and Egypt will know what kind of God I am. They will know my character. They will know my person. He says, you will know who I am by the time we're done. You will know who God is. It won't be an ignorance issue. Verse 3, then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. So please let us go three days' journey to make sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest He fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. Again, words that we didn't hear God say exactly to Moses, but Moses capturing the idea that there are going to be consequences, the Lord has said, that He's going to deliver them by His mighty arm when you won't listen. And what Moses says here is prophetic. It does come true. The Lord is going to Visit them with disease and death for their rebellion and disobedience against him. Moses is saying, if you ignore the voice of the Lord, if you will not listen to his voice, there are going to be disastrous, devastating, personal consequences on your life and on your nation. Let us go or else, says the Lord. And remember... This harshness of God is not because 
only that Pharaoh is a slaveholder, but it's because he is stopping God's children from worshiping him as their father. They should be calling Yahweh father, but Pharaoh wants them to call him master. And so this warning comes. And look at verses 4 and 5. The king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to the burdens. Pharaoh puts the blame on Moses and Aaron. He says, why do you take the people away? Again, failing to listen that it's the Lord who is calling the people away, not Moses, not Aaron. It's not their desire, ultimately, it's, it's God's. Pharaoh's asking, why do you take them away from working for me? And of course, the answer is because God says He wants them to serve Him. Why do you take them away from Egypt? God says, so that they can be with me. They are not your property, they are my children, God would say. Well, that's some of the verses in detail, but before we close, let's put this, kind of siphon that through the good news of the gospel. Let's look at this dialogue here as a very practical way for Christian witness. You're not Moses. There's not a Pharaoh you're going to encounter, but I think that this lesson is very applicable for us. Look carefully. Look at your Bible. Look how Moses and Aaron begin. This is going to sound harsh when you think about sharing the gospel, but they begin with a command that comes directly from God. They tell Pharaoh what he needs to do, what God demands that he does. They say you need to listen to the voice of God. They don't appeal to Pharaoh's felt needs. They don't try to soften that demand. They don't say something like, you know, Pharaoh, if you would just believe in God, you and Mrs. Pharaoh would have a better marriage. They don't say, you know, you would have a richer, more successful life. Or don't you want to accept Jesus so he'll make your dreams come true? Help you grow your business or be a better person? That's not what they say. They say God demands something from you. And they explain who this God is that's making the demand. He's the specific, knowable God. He's the God of the Hebrews. He's the God of Israel. His name is Yahweh. He's the God of the covenant. Moses could go on if he had time to explain. He's merciful. He's just. He's holy. He's sacrificial. He's caring. He hears us. He sees us, not like these gods of Egypt. And what they do is then they proclaim God's demand, and then they explain that demand and who God is, and then look what happens next. They give a warning. If you will not listen to God's voice, there are disastrous personal consequences for you. It's not a threat. It's a reality. Dear ones, the gospel is really no different than what we just read. God sends us forth as His missionaries, as His ambassadors, as His gospelizers to proclaim His demand for people, explain who He is, and give people His gracious warning to them, if you will not bow to Yahweh, there are disastrous personal consequences for your life. Dear ones, the gospel is, is a demand. The Son, Jesus Christ, says, believe in me. Repent and believe in me. The Father says, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. It's a command. The Holy Spirit announces the Word of God, convicts us of sin, and tells us, turn away from yourself and turn to the Lord. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. It's a desire of God. It's His will revealed. It's not an offer that you take or leave. You don't just choose to believe in God or not. Our proclamation is not, do you want to believe in Jesus today? 
Dear ones, that's, that's not what we're supposed to say. Would you like to go to heaven? No. We are there for us to come with a demand. Repent of your sins and believe in the only God there is. That is our call in the gospel. And again, that, that call needs rightly some explanation because my friends are going to ask, what do you mean repent? And I need to say, well, repent means that God wants you to turn away from your sins and turn to Him. He wants you to turn away from listening to your own voice and listen to Him. He wants you to turn away from looking for hope and meaning and identity in those things, in those relationships, and find them only in Him. He wants you to repent not only of the things you have done, but the sinner that you are, and turn to Him. And then my friend says, well, what do you mean by believe? I believe there's a God. And I say, well, what he wants is for you to trust in his son, Jesus Christ, who has given his life in place of yours to take the just wrath of God so that God's wrath would pass over you and fall on him so that he can set you free from your bondage to yourself and your sins Trust that He is the Savior who died in your place. Trust that His life covers you in His righteousness. Trust that His resurrection is real and He's alive. Put your trust in this specific God. Then we're going to need to explain that and unpack that and tell them what it means. That Jesus Christ wants a life for them that's free of addictions to self and an obsession with the trinkets of this world that God will connect His life to their life, and they will have God's life pulsing through them, transforming them, rebirthing them, that their life, when they trust in Jesus, will be connected to life Himself, united to the real King, and they'll live an ultimate purpose to glorify His name. And that comes with a warning If you will not believe in Jesus, then your life will be lost forever. And then you're going to have to explain that. Why would a loving God want people to go to hell? Well, this loving God knows that those who refuse to bow to Jesus as Lord and listen to His voice as King, they're going to be lost in the wilderness of this world because there is no other Savior coming to save them. There is no other name by which they can be redeemed. And the consequence of that is an eternity of giving them exactly what they have now, a life apart from God, where their soul will be destroyed eternally. And God loves you and wants you to have a different destiny. He wants you to live with Him. God sent His firstborn Son so that anyone and everyone who will believe in Him who will put their trust in Him, who will listen to His voice, that by faith they will repent of their sins and trust in Him, and they will receive eternal life. That is our call. Again, I'll recap it quickly. You want to share the gospel? Do this. Number one, there is a real God. He is the eternal I Am. He is very real. He knows your name. He knows what you need most because He designed you. He knows what's killing you from the inside out right now. Even before the creation of the world, He knows who will belong to Him. Number two, you tell them His name. His name is Yahweh, and He makes Himself most known to you by the Son, Jesus Christ. You tell them next what God wants. This is where you can't cower. You can't start talking about felt needs. You need to be bold. This is a demand. It's a loving call, but nonetheless, it's a demand God wants most from you, friend, to repent of your sins and turn to Him, to put your trust in Him as Savior, as Lord. And then you unpack that as much as you need to. Friend, your biggest problem isn't your spouse or your job or your money. You're most centrally not your looks or your resume or your friendships or your failures. Your ultimate hope isn't what you can accomplish. Your most crippling problem isn't drugs or self-confidence or a low education. 
Your biggest problem is you were handmade to serve the king that you will not serve. You were designed to listen to the God whose voice you have been ignoring, and he's graciously calling out to you to repent and believe in him. And then you have to give them, number four, a dire warning. If you will not trust in Jesus, if you will not listen to his voice, you will die eternally as a slave in your sin. Because Allah and Buddha and Krishna and Mary and any God you make up with your hands, they cannot do what Jesus Christ can do. And if you will not listen to his voice, you will die in your sins. And then number five, you remember you're going to have to explain this to people who ask which God, why him, why should I listen to his voice? And for some of those people, it's going to be an intellectual question. It's going to be an ignorance. I've never heard of Jesus Christ, even though I grew up in New England. My great-grandfather went to a congregational church, but I've never heard of this. What do I do? We had a guy like that here last Sunday evening, a 10th grade student who came here by himself to church and says, I want to know about God. My family doesn't talk about him. I have no idea. Where do I start? Right? Right? And you're going to have to explain that. And they might ask, is the resurrection of Jesus real? How do I know that the Bible is really God's revealed word? And by the way, how did Noah get all those animals on that boat? And you need to understand, that's called apologetics. You need to explain these things. But dear ones, as you do that, you need to pray. Because in addition to the intellectual ignorance, there are people who are going to be outright disobedient and full of hate against God. If you don't believe me, just go look at some of the comments on our YouTube videos. Look at the world. There's going to be an unbelief. It's not merely intellectual, it's rebellious. We push back because we do not want to give up our lives to God. Our hearts are hardwired in sin to not believe so we need to pray for our friends and our family and our co-workers and strangers that we share the gospel with. Lord, soften their hard heart that they will receive what you're telling them. And we need to trust that the gospel is, as Romans 1.15 says, the power of God for salvation. Speak the words of God. God will be lifting and pray for their hearts. This is how we share the gospel but we have to do so answering that question firmly in our own hearts. Who is your Lord? Why do you listen to his voice before you go and tell anyone else to do just that?